So welcome and thank you for joining us today for a personal toolkit for menopause preparedness. This is part of the Society for Women's Health Research's Menopause Mindfulness webinar series. I'm Katie Schubert. I am president and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research, which is the thought leader in promoting research on biological sex differences in disease and in improving women's health through science, policy, and education. Approximately 1.3 million women in the United States transition into menopause each year. SWHR's Menopause Mindfulness Series was created to increase awareness about the impact of menopause on women's health. And these events discuss how to improve health outcomes through recognizing and addressing symptoms, comorbidities, treatment options, and barriers to accessing quality care while highlighting the diverse experiences of women during and after the menopause transition. And we are pleased today to have three amazing panelists joining us for our event. Dr. Jamia Cortez, Assistant Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Nursing. Dr. Wen Shen, Associate Professor of Clinical Gynecology and Co-Director of the Women's Wellness and Healthy Aging Program at Johns Hopkins um, School of Medicine. And Claire Gill, Patient Advocate for Menopause. Um, and she's also the CEO of the Bone Health and Osteos Osteoporosis Foundation um, and a friend of SWHR. I'd also like to thank um, the sponsors of today's uh, event, Estellas Pharma and Pfizer. And as always, we will be live tweeting this event and we invite you to use the hashtag SWHR Talks Menopause on all social media. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce SWHR's Chief Science Officer, Dr. Irene Aninye, who will be moderating today's event. Irene? Thank you, Katie, and welcome everyone. Typically in a woman's late 40s or 50s, the body undergoes hormonal changes characterized by a significant decrease in estrogen, followed by the ending of a woman's menstrual cycles. Menopausal symptoms and experiences vary widely from person to person, ranging from hot flashes and sleep and mood disturbances to genital and urinary symptoms, such as vaginal dryness and urinary incontinence. SWHR's menopause program was established to draw awareness to research gaps and unmet needs in clinical care, education, and policy concerning menopause and its impact on women's health. We have established a working group of researchers and healthcare providers with expertise in gynecologic health and midlife care, as well as patients and patient advocates and healthcare decision makers who are committed to improving care for women through midlife and menopause. With the guidance of the experts in our menopause education working group, SWHR has developed a patient toolkit to help women navigate their menopause care. Raising awareness and improving access to information about menopause can help reduce stigma surrounding menopause and aging and better prepare women and their healthcare providers to address potential challenges during this stage in their lives, as well as maintain a full and healthy and high quality of life. Today, we have three members of our working group with us to continue our menopause mindfulness series, a personal toolkit for menopause preparedness highlighting information that will be found in the toolkit and sharing their insights as to how we can better understand menopause, recognize a transition, and manage symptoms and comorbid conditions from both clinical and patient perspectives. Following the speaker presentations, I will be moderating a discussion with all of our panelists, so we invite you to use the Q&A function to submit questions throughout the event. I'll now introduce Dr. Yamnia Cortez, who will, develop, who will help us demystify menopause, with an introduction of sex hormones throughout the lifespan and the different stages, pathways, and symptoms that women can experience as they transition into menopause. Thank you for joining us, Yamina. Hello, thank you. Um, as mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit about demystifying menopause. And so, why are we talking about menopause? Um, because it is still a mystery to so many people. Um, as reported in this New York Times article, over 1 billion women worldwide will experience perimenopause by 2025, but we don't hear too much about it. Um, that's why forums like these are really important. Individuals um, 
do not feel prepared to experience menopause, and there are many providers who feel unprepared to manage it. And I hope that today we begin to unveil some of this mystery. I'll start by introducing estrogen and progesterone, the primary female reproductive hormones produced in the ovaries. These two hormones play critical roles in sexual development and reproductive health throughout a woman's lifespan, um, from first menstruation, through childbearing years, and into midlife. And as shown in this figure, um, as menstruating individuals begin to age, uh, the ovaries produce less estrogen, causing changes to the menstrual cycle, such as irregularity and duration, flow, and unpredictability. These hormone changes also result in body changes. This is uh, what we call the menopause transition during this timing period where we're starting to note these fluctuations in hormone and changes in the body. Um, and this menopause transition or perimenopause on average can last four years, but some individuals report um, that it can last eight up to 10 um, years. And it'll last until the production of these hormones eventually stops along with the menstrual cycles and that would result in menopause. Importantly, 45% of women don't know the difference between perimenopause and menopause prior to when they begin to know these um, symptoms. So here we present the stages of menopause, or the stages of reproductive aging. Um, the reproductive years uh, typically last about 30 to 35 years. And this is the timing where individuals are experiencing predictable cycles, um, hormones are stable. Uh, these are the childbearing years as well um, for those who choose to have children. Perimenopause, is the timing that I mentioned earlier where you have that transition. Uh, the cycles are changing, the body begins to change, noticing certain symptoms. Um, and then menopause is initiated after one year without a menstrual cycle. So the without menses for 12 consecutive months after that, that is the menopause, that we know the individual has undergone menopause and afterwards, uh, for the remainder of the life, you'll be in postmenopause. The average age of menopause in the US is 51 years, but that can vary. Um, any age over 45 is usually considered a typical age, uh, menopause at a typical age. Some individuals may experience premature menopause, that is before age 40, or early men menopause, which is between 40 and 45. The age and pathway to menopause can vary. Um, menopause can occur spontaneously or naturally for many women, um, the way that I previously presented it. However, some individuals may experience menopause earlier due to certain medical conditions and medications, um, such as undergoing chemotherapy, radiation, surgical removal of the ovaries, certain genetic factors, or autoimmune disorders. There are various symptoms associated with, many, with menopause. You or someone you know has most likely experienced more than one of these. Uh, what we call the cardinal sign of menopause, basal motor symptoms. Three-fourths of women report experiencing these. Hot flashes, night sweats, um, may also experience changes in mood and um, premenstrual syndrome. Um, depressive symptoms, increased anxiety, sleep disturbances, and insomnia, which are often linked to hot flashes. If you're experiencing a hot flash, it's very uncomfortable to sleep at night. You may wake up more often due to that or just find it difficult to uh, fall asleep. Um, as mentioned earlier, genital urinary syndrome of menopause, genital symptoms, sexual symptoms, so vaginal dryness, itchiness, um, pain with intercourse, uh, decreased desire, but sometimes it's also due to the fact that you're experiencing these genital symptoms, you can't sleep, you're experiencing hot flashes, so you also. Um, feel a lower sex drive, and then as well as urinary symptoms. Uh, women may also experience brain fog or difficulty concentrating, um, changes in learning and memory, weight gain typically around the hips and stomach, uh, 
on average, there might be um, some reports of about five to 10 pound increase, joint pain um, and heart palpitations. Now, if these hot flashes, weight gain, and sleep difficulties are rated um, by women as being the ones that cause the most impact. Importantly, not everyone experiences menopause the same way. For example, the study of women's health across the nation reported variations in how long vasomotor symptoms last. The average duration of vasomotor symptoms varies by race, ranging from 4.8 years in Japanese women and 10.1 years in Black and African American women. Um, in addition, women of color have been noted to uh, report um, longer, uh, worse symptoms, more symptoms, experience earlier perimenopause, experience a longer menopause duration. And some of these differences may be due to other social uh, and environmental factors like socioeconomic status, smoking status, the neighborhood where one, where people live, um, history of trauma, stress, and discrimination. Uh, and that is all I have so far um, until the next presenter. Thank you, Dr. Cortez. Next, we'll have Dr. Wen Chen discussing managing your menopause care, highlighting various treatment options and approaches, including hormone therapy for managing menopause symptoms and health conditions that often affect women after menopause. Okay. Always have to remember to click my video and mute buttons. Otherwise, I'm just a talking head, right? So um, I am Wen Chen. I'm here to talk about um, how to manage your menopause. And that is very important as was just reviewed. Menopause can cause a lot of distressing symptoms. Next slide. So, Vasomotor symptoms were VMS, yeah, very, very common, right? So most people will understand that menopausal women um, have hot flashes. And what's interesting is that 73% of women are not treating their menopause symptoms. And, but 80% of women can experience hot flashes with an average duration of 10 years. So a lot of women are suffering and many of them suffering needlessly. Next slide. So ways that you can help yourself with hot flashes would be staying cool with layered clothing and with these cool blankets and cooling mattresses and cooling cloths. But what um, a lot of patients and I agree is that even if you were to strip naked, sometimes the hot flash will still go on and you will get arrested. So that doesn't always work. Cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness strategies have been shown to decrease the severity of the hot flashes. Um, they will not get rid of the hot flashes, but they can help you cope. Medications such as low-dose antidepressants, anticonvulsants, hypertension drugs, and bladder relaxants have also been shown to help decrease the severity of the hot flash flashes so that you can cope. Cooling devices, as I mentioned, um, there are cooling blankets, cooling mattresses, cooling pillows, um, also cooling wipes that you can use, you can carry your own personal fan around and um, they can help you cope during one of your hot flash. And then finally, the gold standard is hormone therapy, right? You're experiencing these hot flashes because of hormonal changes, especially during perimenopause when your hormones, ovarian hormones are going on a roller coaster ride. And so no wonder you're so miserable. And so hormone therapy is what's causing your symptoms. I mean, hormones are what's causing your symptoms and therefore hormone therapy will help control those symptoms. 
And there are also triggers that you can look out for. So um, they include things like spicy food and um, intake of sugar, alcohol, especially red wine, unfortunately, for those of us who love our glass of wine with dinner or caffeine. So you kind of have to pick your poison, right? And so if you know you are going out for some spicy food for dinner, be ready for the hot flashes that will follow because you know that's a trigger for you. Okay, next. So treatment for hot flashes, your lifestyle approaches would be a healthy diet. So staying away from the triggers that you know that cause you to have um, hot flashes, but a healthy diet that contributes to weight management will also help because um, weight loss and exercise can help lessen the extent of the hot flashes that you experience. Also stress management, um, doing mindfulness. These are all options that do help. And last but not least, sleep. Sleep is so important. And unfortunately, um, so many of us in this day and age, and especially during pandemics, we've got so much going on, so much stress in our lives that sleep becomes very, very difficult. And we know that if you have um, disturbed sleep and you don't get good restful sleep, you are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease, for a weight gain, for early onset dementia. So sleep is very important. Talk to your doctor about it. Um, you may need a referral for the sleep medicine people so they can evaluate if, you know, what may be at the root of your sleep disturbance. Next. And the treatment prescript, so, for complementary and alternative approaches, if you don't want to go with prescription medications, as I mentioned before, cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness, yoga is also very calming and a form of mindfulness. Acupuncture actually has some published very, very small studies in breast cancer patients that seem to help decrease the severity of the hot flashes. So that's a possibility. Herbal remedies and supplements and phytoestrogens, do be careful with those because they do not have evidence-based research done on them and they are not um, controlled by the FDA. So they can basically make any kind of claims they want on their labels um, and they can say they cure cancer. Um, and obviously that would be a lie, um, but so just be very careful about these options and um, do read your labels and also just do your research when it comes to these non-FDA approved options. The other thing that I also would like to mention is if you do go to a provider who is part of a, um, a medical center who is involved in research, ask for the, if there are research studies, research programs that you can be a part of, be a participant, because that way you might get um, benefits from the research and you are also then contributing to the data and information that we have about how to treat the menopause hot flashes. And maybe you will be contributing to your daughter's menopause. Next slide. So when it comes to hormone therapy, okay? So there are several types of hormones and one thing that I always want to make clear to my patients is that not all estrogen and progesterone 
therapies are created equal. They have very different chemical structures and they may be manufactured for very different conditions. For example, the estrogen and progestins that are in birth control pills are very different from the estrogens and progestins that are in oral menopause treatments. And they are even more different from transdermal menopause options. So don't just lump all of the hormones into one pot because you have to differentiate them. And also they may have benefits for different aspects of your menopause symptoms. So do discuss those with your provider. And this is a question that I get all the time. Do you prescribe bioidentical hormones? I don't want any hormones except bioidentical hormones. Well, the 17 beta estradiol that I prescribe for my patients comes from big pharma and it's made in a big laboratory. But where does the 17 beta estradiol come from? It comes from wild Mexican yams. Now you can't go around eating wild Mexican yams all the time in order to control your symptoms. So they obviously concentrate down the estrogen in that yam and make it into palatable, manageable um, treatment options. Compounded bioidentical hormones are sometimes necessary. It's not something that I would recommend because they are normally not um, paid for by your insurance. They can be extremely expensive and they may offer no additional benefit over insurance covered FDA approved hormone therapy. So again, the compounded bioidentical hormones would be something that I would resort to if a patient has tried every single FDA approved hormone therapy and either had no benefits or had side effects or any number of other reasons why the FDA approved hormones did not work for her. Now, how to administer hormone therapy. Just like I said, not all estrogens and progestins um, for treatment are created equal, neither are the administration, okay? So you can, there are certain hormone therapies that are meant to affect your whole body. So they can help with hot flashes, sleep, um, you know, feelings of anxiety, depression, um, vaginal dryness, they can help with your bone health. They, you know, estrogen is one of the best options for um, supporting your bones. Uh, so the systemic hormones are that, but because of their systemic effect, do realize that they might increase your risk for breast cancer. But with the present formulations and dosages, that would be something that it would be long-term use beyond five to 10 years. Localized hormone therapy are usually addressing vaginal symptoms. Well, more than vaginal symptoms, the genital urinary syndrome of menopause that was discussed. So they are usually so minimal in dose that their effect is limited to the vagina, the vulva, and the bladder. So if you are not having any other symptoms except for the um, genital urinary syndrome and are having painful intercourse, so or having um, recurrent urinary tract infections, then maybe all you need is the localized treatment. 
And that way you are spared any of the risks of the systemic hormone therapy. And these localized treatments are so low dose that they basically do not increase your blood estrogen level beyond that of a menopause level. So that's the difference. Next. And then considerations for your personal care plan. So make a roadmap for your healthy aging. That is something that I preach to all my patients who come to my women's wellness and healthy aging program is what is your age? What is your goal? You know, say if you're 51 now and you're just going through menopause, what is your goal for when you're 61, 71, 81, right? Because we know now the average age for women in the United States is in mid eighties. So you have another 30 years to live. What are your goals? What? So then you need to start considering what sort of lifestyle and activity and how to manage your symptoms, how to treat and how to live in a more healthful fashion so that you can get to your 80s and still be vibrant. In addition to the fact that menopause is very expensive, okay? And there, is, there are plenty of studies that have shown that menopause costs um, companies in um, patient calling out sick and also patients um, having issues with her symptoms. So it costs six, over $1,600 to treat women for menopause hot flashes annually. So if you were to take proactive steps and help yourself stay healthy, you will be doing not just yourself, but the society a favor. Next. So common impacts of menopause, as I mentioned before, it's very, very important to start planning for your healthy aging. And the three items, um, the three conditions that I always review with my patients, all of these um, items on this um, slide is important, but I focus on heart health, brain health, and bone health. Because we know that osteoporotic fractures severely impact women after they've had a hip fracture, 80% of those women do not get back to the activity level that they were at before. And the increase in mortality as a result of fragility fracture is just over the top. Cardiovascular disease, right? If your heart doesn't work right, you are not a healthy person. So, so important to have a lifestyle with healthy diet and exercise that promotes healthy heart and blood vessels. And then cognition. We are all so aware of Alzheimer's now. Everybody is just so concerned about it. And, um, but there's a certain amount of memory change, memory loss that happens normally with aging. So that is something that you would want to review with your provider and maybe be um, referred to a neurologist and be evaluated to see if you do have early signs of dementia and if there are any sort of options for your treatment. And very important as the other items that I've mentioned before, sleep, genital urinary, um, weight gain and diabetes for diet, and then also mental health. Depression and anxiety is rampant in perimenopause and menopausal women. And um, people who do research in mental health will say that there are three times of um, vulnerability for women. And that is at puberty, 
during her pregnancies and at menopause. And guess what? They're all related to our hormones. And our hormones also have effect on our digestion. So my program has um, gastroenterologists associated with us who do see a lot of our, of our patients because a lot of women present with GI issues. And then finally, hair and skin, those are not something that um, as a gynecologist, I can normally do much to treat. And usually I refer patients with these issues to their dermatologist. Okay, so that is it for my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Shen. Please note for those that are tuned in live, you can submit questions at any time um, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to address as many as we can during the panel discussion portion of the event. Um, last, but certainly not least, we have Claire Gill, who will be discussing a living well through menopause, where she will share her menopause journey, lifestyle and wellness tips, and how she embarked upon advocacy work to support others in the menopause space. Thanks so much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to represent the millions of women experiencing menopause right at this moment. So I feel a, a great weight on my shoulders to get this right. But um, first, I'd like to talk about the fact that menopause is not a bad word. So let's all learn to say it, because if we're going to get the assistance that we need to help us through this journey, we're going to need to be able to talk about it. So I really would encourage everyone to just start saying the word menopause. Um, next slide, please. So um, before I kind of jump into what we can do when we prepare for a visit, I did just want to talk a little bit about what that journey is and, and what it means to me, and then um, hopefully kind of provide some tips and tools that are available in, in many locations and certainly in the fantastic menopause toolkit that um, the Society for Women's Health Research has just helped create. So um, one of the things we also need to keep in mind as we're talking about menopause is that it's not a disease. Um, as our clinician uh, experts have just shared, there's so many things that go into um, this journey for us. And we are really only patients when we become, um, it becomes necessary for us to seek treatment for some of those symptoms. So again, while it is definitely something that we need to address medically, and there are a lot of options as we've just learned, it's also really important that we just talk about the fact that it is a normal stage of life. And so if we think about it that way, hopefully it will help us be able to talk about it with our, with our healthcare professionals and seek the guidance that we need. Um, my journey is probably the same as so many women. I knew nothing about menopause before I uh, started exhibiting symptoms. And it was actually friends who were exhibiting symptoms. Um, another colleague had, friend had taken out a fan and was fanning herself. And uh, we all kind of looked at each other and that's when we started talking about it. Oh my God, yeah, me too, this is crazy. Um, and I would often share that my mom was a nurse and I remember her going through menopause um, because she had me a little bit later in life. And, um, and she would be like, open the window, close the window, open the window, close the window. But we didn't talk about menopause the way we did talk about puberty and the way we talked about childbearing years. And so um, when I started experiencing menopausal symptoms, that's really when I talked with my mom about what was her experience like, because there is often a connection with how our, our mothers or grandmothers have experienced it and then some of the symptoms that we have. But menopause is very, very individual. So as we looked at all the charts and things about the types of symptoms that women have, not all women will experience all of those symptoms, and that doesn't mean you're not menopausal. So I've also spoken to a lot of women who tell me, oh, I, I didn't have hot flashes, I'm not going through menopause. And then we talk about some of the other symptoms, and then they are exhibiting those and realize, oh, wow, I, I am already transitioning. And they don't think about it because most women identify, again, culturally, we identify with just hot flashes or night sweats. So it's really important that we do look at and learn more about what are those changes happening in our bodies and what do we do about it? So let's talk about what we do about it. 
So as the clinicians that have gone before me have just said, it's really important that you talk with your healthcare provider about what you're experiencing. And given that it's really very personal when we're talking about our libido, when we're talking about vaginal dryness, when we're talking about our sleep habits, our sex habits, or even admitting that we don't feel ourselves and we're depressed and we've never been a depressed person perhaps before, but we are experiencing some of those symptoms now. So there's nothing to be ashamed of when you go to a clinic or provider, your healthcare provider, whether that's a doctor or a nurse practitioner, and talk to them about what you're experiencing. Within the recent toolkit is a fantastic menopause care journal that you can use to help you identify what are you experiencing and then bringing those pages or those information, whether it's from the, the, the journal that we provided or whether it's just jotting it down in a notebook and making sure that you don't forget to address them with your doctor. You should talk about the types of symptoms you're having. Again, you might not be having hot flashes or you might not have any brain fog, but you might be experiencing again, some of the other symptoms that were talked about disruption in sleep or you know the need for um, more time to kind of get things done because you're a little bit sluggish or you're tired more than usual. So these are the things that we really need to track. And although I think some of us kind of fall off on tracking our menstrual cycle when you sort of think, you know, your, your post-reproductive years are what you think those are, it's really important that you do keep track of your menstrual cycle, even when you're not trying to conceive, and that you know when you have not had your period, either for a number of um, months in a row, or most importantly, in a, for a full year in a row, because that's what you really need to talk about your clinician with and let them know that so they can help determine what stage of the menopausal journey are you in. It's also important to know any other medications or any other um, conditions that you might have that could also impact some of the symptoms that you're experiencing and or how those diseases or those conditions or those symptoms impact your menopausal journey. So think again, it's really helpful to just take a few minutes to prepare before you go into your you know, doctor, because we get into the, the room, the waiting room, we're thinking about it, and then we start some chit chat with our clinician when we go in, and the next thing you know, your time is up and you're headed out the door and you've never addressed some of the things that you really needed to. Next slide, please. So what are some of the things that you should ask? Um, again, it really depends on what you're experiencing, but talk about what those symptoms are first and say it at the very beginning of the visit. It's really important. Again, don't leave it to the last minute when again, your, your healthcare provider is kind of getting ready to go on to the next patient. That's not the time to say, oh, I have something very important I need to discuss. So really start with that. I'm here for my well visit or I'm here for my pap smear or whatever it is, but say, I really wanna mention this first. And if there's no time to go through those specifics and the, re deal, the details then, that's okay. You can schedule another appointment to address these things specifically. But when you're at this visit, really important, bring up, this is what I'm experiencing and start that conversation. The other important thing is to talk about what are the treatment options. If your provider does have time at that visit to go through everything with you, then ask them about hormone replacement therapy. Ask them about some of the other therapies that were just discussed today and find out what might potentially be right for you. Um, and then also again, talk with them about other options. I know um, we, we just heard about how yoga and, um, and even acupuncture in some places can, uh, can help. And I know for other conditions that I've experienced, they've been really very helpful. And much like a clinical provider, you can also find specialists who work with women at this stage of life who do yoga, who do um, acupuncture, who are very specific to treating women at this stage of life. So take some time to figure that out as well. Next slide, please. Maintaining a work-life balance is also really important. As these statistics show, there are a lot of women who are in the workforce during the menopausal transition. And um, we've made great advances during our reproductive years in a woman's life to make accommodations for women at work um, to be able to take time off or to adjust things physically in their environment to help them better manage the reproductive years. It's the same thing for the menopausal stage. Unfortunately, it's just not as common. So if we as a generation are going to do something about that, then we need to speak up. And you need to know you're not alone. 
So um, while you might be the first one to mention it, and you might not want to be the first one to mention it into your office, it is really important to talk about. And perhaps you can talk with your coworkers, other female coworkers first, and then kind of work up the courage to sort of bring it to the attention of your supervisors. Certainly the Society for, um, for Women's Health and Research and other organizations are working hard to make this more of a priority within the workspace. Um, I also represent the National Menopause Foundation and we too are working to make menopause something that people are willing to talk about and address and to provide women with the education they need to be able to have these conversations. So what are some of the things you can think about? Flexible work hours. The good news is in our not quite post COVID world, flex hours have become much more common. So again, this might be something that's already being addressed for you where you don't have to go into the office as often as uh, we did pri you know, prior to the COVID uh, virus. Um, working from home can actually help. The, just the flexibility of when we have to be on calls and whether or not we have to be on camera. I'm sure you're all experiencing that fatigue as well. Um, and then just other small things that might help you do a better job of being able to address some of the symptoms during the workday. I'm going to um, share with you, if you can see it on camera, if I can bring it up, I'll get it into the point where uh, there, where you can see it past my screen. This little plug-in fan can be found uh, like on Amazon for about 12 bucks. You can find it in other stores too. It connects directly to your computer and it sits on my desk. And I'm telling you, it is a game changer. So really think about some of the small things that you can do that help you to manage your symptoms throughout the day. And I'm sure if you bring up some of these things, it's not difficult to make these accommodations for you. So do please talk about it and think about what it is that you need to make your life easier in the workplace or even at home. Obviously, um, I'm actually at my home office today and the, I have a fan at work and a fan here. So again, what is it that's gonna make you more productive and helpful? And why should people care about it? Well, the statistic on this slide shows, you know, we lose about $150 billion in productivity because women are suffering through menopausal symptoms. So anything that we can do to address those and make it easier for women to be highly productive as we all want to be and we are, then the better it is for the businesses we work for. Next slide, please. Um, it was talked about earlier uh, in the presentation about mindfulness as well and what that means. And I think this is often a topic that's the least discussed when, it talk, when we talk about menopausal symptoms, because no one wants to talk about the fact that, you know, they're feeling a little bit depressed, um, particularly if you were maybe not a, a person who experienced depression before. And to have those types of feelings and things happening at this stage of life makes you wonder, what's wrong with me? And it turns out there's nothing wrong with you. This is something that happens because of the loss of estrogen in our bodies. So what can we do about it? Well, again, there's a lot of opportunity to spend a little more time focusing on self-care, um, meditation, yoga that was talked about before, the sleep, which is, again is critical to us at every stage of life. So not surprising that would it be critical during this stage of life. And then also just wanting people to know that if you have had um, symptoms of depression before, you will likely potentially have them again during the menopause transition. So it's important that we talk about it and that we get the assistance from mental health providers the same way we do for our clinical providers. Next slide, please. Building a community of support can also be really important. Um, you don't have to jump in and start telling everybody that you're menopausal, although that would help us as a generation move past the stigma, I think. But it is really important to talk about it with your friends and family and your coworkers, those you feel comfortable with, so that you have that support you need. You have people telling you, oh, I've experienced that too. And again, there's a lot of great resources available to help you um, within your um, community, like again, you know, those that you're close with. Um, but again, the National Menopause Foundation, we also have a, an online community called the Menopause Metamorphosis, where you can chat anonymously with other women who are experiencing menopause and find out how they're managing their symptoms. Um, and there's a lot of other organizations and support groups, you can find them online as well, that will give you an opportunity to sort of check in and realize that you're not alone. But most importantly, you know, this last part of this slide that we, we focus on is asking for help. It's okay to say, I need help with this. I'm not quite sure what to do about what I'm experiencing. Next slide, please. 
And that could be the end of our slide, please. So thank you very much. And now I think we're going to question and answers. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, and everyone, um, I invite you to turn on your cameras so we can get into our Q&A. We have about a good 10 minutes or so um, for this portion. Again, we invite attendees to submit questions um, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to address as many individual ones and also some common themes as we can, um, but we might not be able to get to them all. And I see, and so I'm looking at some of the trends of questions. And so I wanted to start off with, um, when you mentioned about um, the hormones and not all of them are equal, but what is the role of progesterone in menopause symptoms and you know, the use of either bioidentical progesterones or natural creams as a hormone therapy? I guess I'll take that. Um, so yeah, progesterone is just as important. However, um, most significantly estrogen controls most of the menopausal symptoms. So actually for women who have had hysterectomies, don't have a uterus anymore, they can be on just estrogen alone. But on the other hand, I also have patients who are on progesterone alone because their primary symptoms are um, progesterone based. And so they actually don't like the way estrogen makes them feel, but they um, find relief with progesterone. So yes, there's definitely a role for progesterone in menopause treatment. However, the majority of women find um, alleviation of their symptoms with estrogen. And then um, this is for either of you, if there's a family history of heart disease or breast cancer, some of those conditions that are commonly, is someone still a candidate for hormone therapy? And you know what? How, how would they go about that conversation with their provider? So depending on their, the, the history, um, we need to delve into it deeper, right? So if a woman has, um, because breast cancer is so common now, right? One out of eight women will get breast cancer. And so, but the majority of the breast cancers occur in postmenopausal women. And those are, you know, usually multifactorial, not necessarily genetic. And because the majority of the everybody thinks about the BRCA genes for breast cancer, majority of those cancers tend to occur in young premenopausal women. So when you talk about family history of breast cancer, you need to specify which kind you have. And then with regards to cardiovascular disease, that also depends on the type of cardiovascular disease and the age at which the relative had their first heart attack, okay? So if there is a family history of early onset heart disease, and that would be before the age of 55 in men and before the age of 65 in women, then, I mean, that doesn't exclude them from going on hormone therapy, but for these women, I usually will refer them to um, we have a special women's cardiology group and refer them to the cardiologist to be evaluated for their risk factors so that they can be, again, proactive about their health so that, you know, remember what I asked, where do you want to be at 61, 71, 81? So these are all elements to take into consideration for healthy aging. And so Claire, we'll probably start with you on this one. When did you, well, the question I'm curious is, is you know, when's the best time to discuss menopause with your healthcare provider? And so then also Claire, for you, when did you discuss this? You know, when did you start to have that conversation? Did you have it early or was it after the fact? <laughs> 
I did. My, my situation was a little bit different, uh, though. I had my first and only child at um, 41, almost 42, and then um, was skipping periods uh, a couple you know, in the next year or two. And so I was actually concerned I might be pregnant again. Um, so that was how the conversation came about, actually, where I said, hi, you know, I'm this is what's happening. It's happened three months and then I spot again. And, you know, do you think, I don't know what's happening. And so um, that's how the conversation started. And, um, and we did a blood test um, and found out that, um, that, yeah, I was actually, I was, um, my levels were low and I was, you know, starting the transition. So it really is, as we said, it's a really personal um, conversation. So to say when's the right time um, is really different for every woman. Um, unfortunately, I've heard from many women who will say that they went to their provider who did not, who said, as you said, it's too early, it's not that, um, and sort of dismissed it, um, or who they had a bunch of other tests done uh, to check what else it could possibly be before they had the conversation about being, uh, being menopausal. So I think the, the, the message here is to be your own best advocate. Ask the question, if you get dismissed, go back and ask it again, or start, you know, again, finding other people to speak with. And again, there's a lot of more uh, opportunities these days to reach out to providers who do know more about the menopausal transition. Um, that's not always easy if you're in a small community, but that's what um, the internet has brought to us. You can access or do telehealth visits with clinicians who might be a better um, source. Um, I would suggest checking out the North American Menopause Society for their list of clinical providers. These are providers who have gone through special training um, because of their interest in menopause. And again, these days, a telehealth visit will be our best friend and might be a possibility. And obviously turn to, to the clinical experts to say what else they recommend. I have to second that. That is because not every you know, there's been a lot of evidence that shows that a lot of clinicians had not been trained in menopause and still continue to not be trained in during residency in menopause. So there are a lot of clinicians out there who are not qualified to counsel women on menopause. And those who are honest about it would say that to the woman, but others will just say, it's all in your head. And that could be so destructive for a woman because here she is having mood swings and depression and anxiety. And she already thinks she's going crazy and to have uh, a physician say that to her. So definitely go to the NAMS, N-A-M-S website and you can put in your zip code and find qualified um, menopause practitioners near you and yeah, and get evidence-based consultation. And so Yamnia, with some of your, your research, and I know you do some with epidemiology, what do you, can you speak to like, um, autoimmune conditions? We know that they are more prevalent in women but even this postmenopausal diagnosis of autoimmune conditions, have you, what have you found in your, in your research or in your studies or occurrence? And I guess even when, if you have any way in there. I don't specialize in autoimmune conditions, but from my understanding that are individuals that are experiencing more symptoms who do have autoimmune conditions during the menopause transition. Um, and some individuals with autoimmune disease will also undergo menopause earlier. So I think that is a thing um, as well that's important going along with the previous question, uh, question is to have that conversation and begin to have that conversation earlier with clinicians about not only your condition, but also your current medications and how that will um, affect your transition during the menopause and potential treatments as well. And then I also, um, I know we, we talked about cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, and I know you have a bit of a, your background, you also deal with risk for cardiovascular disease. I didn't know if you wanted to weigh in on that as well. 
for some of the things that we were talking about, a lot of the work that I do does deal with um, the prevention of cardiovascular disease during the transition, because we do see a lot of these symptoms, um, vasomotor symptoms, sleep disturbances, um, as well as the weight gain and how then um, it, you know, increases in like cholesterol and things like that that occur during the menopause transition that really put women at increased risk for heart disease, which is why as Dr. Shen was saying, a lot of those um, lifestyle changes, a lot of the, um, you know, mindfulness, different things to reduce stress, d dietary patterns, it's some of it is aging, of course, because things change with aging and you want to be proactive, but there are a lot of things that are due to menopause itself and what's going on with the changes in the hormones in your body. So it's important to be proactive and we can no longer live like we were living in our 20s or something because our bodies are changing. This unmuted, unmuted. We have a, a few. I want to um, get your final takes on um, on this topic. You know, as we close up, we have patients and patient advocates. We have different organizations. Our audience is wide ranging, even healthcare um, policymakers that tune in um, and. You know, I'd like for each of you to briefly kind of go over what is one takeaway that you like to recommend um, to one or all of these viewer groups to help them support women as they address menopause and midlife aging. And so we'll start with um, Wen and then Yamnia and then um, Jamnia, sorry, and then Claire. So the one, now, I never stick to just one thing. I talk a lot. I think you guys have noticed that. But, um, and I totally agree with, I think what Claire had said, you know, when we're average age of menopause being 51, and I think that's a fabulous age. And I think most women in this day and age are still really vibrant and working and contributing to their um, you know, society. And so it is definitely not a dirty word. However, it is a time when women do need to be aware of their health and all the things that they can do. And it is also a time when I think the government, so there are policy makers listening in. I would like to see menopause medicine become part of a public health initiative, just like smoking cessation, okay? Just think about it, policy makers. If we were able to help prevent heart, the, you know, heart disease, osteoporosis, um, cognitive decline requiring institutionalization. If we were able to help decrease those numbers, how much benefit can we make for society, not to mention how much money could be saved? So please, policymakers out there, take notice and push for menopause medicine to be um, an initiative. Thank you. One of the things that um, I like to advocate for is the fact that not everyone experienced, in addition to what Dr. Shen said, of course, is that not everyone experiences menopause the equally. And I think a lot of the work that we have done in terms of research and our practices have focused on mainly non-Latina white women and uh, cis women experiences. And I think we do need to continue to do more research to look at the differences um, across different women in terms of experiences of menopause, um, perceptions of menopause, so that we can continue to create tools like this as well that can be um, 
individualized to different people, but then also thinking through uh, just like many other conditions that there are social determinants of menopause and inequities in menopause health. And I think that um, that's really important to think about as well. Okay, and I'll wrap up with, okay, we've had advocacy and, and um, policy. Uh, we have research, all very important. And then I'll say education and empowerment. Um, that's the, the key for, for all of us as women. What we can do um, is educate ourselves with, again, all the great tools and things that are available, and then feel empowered to speak up on your own behalf. And again, one of the great things about this stage of life is that we, we are at that time where we have a little bit more wisdom and a little bit more strength perhaps and it's it's too bad that we have to wait till this age to get there but we have it use it let's all work together to bring about the change that we need um, menopause is having a moment let's make it a movement oh i love that <laughs> i love that thank you um thank you all for you know our amazing panel um and time for your insight i know we had a lot of questions that were pouring in and we were only able to address some of them. However, we have additional programs um, that we will be hosting throughout. And so we invite you to um, join in as we continue this conversation. And so again, thank you um, to our panel and also thank you to Estellas Pharma and Pfizer for their support of this event. Uh, we couldn't do this work without the expertise and contributions of our science networks, particularly our menopause education working group members who contributed towards the development of SWHR's menopause preparedness toolkit, a women's empowerment guide. And as you can see here, we're, we will have um, another um, um, addition to our menopause mindfulness series um, where we will look at the, um, looking at the different paths um, to which someone can engage menopause. Um, be it through medical or natural path or um, through medical uh, treatment. We also, and that's August 11th, um, which is also a Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then we have, uh, we will also be talking about workplace accommodations and how to manage your menopause in the workplace and your symptoms to be able to maintain um, your productivity and uh, wellness throughout menopause and midlife. And so we will be sending out an email of today's recording um, to all registrants, as well as to our fertility, as well as um, links to our menopause guide. And I believe that was also draft, drafted, dropped in the chat. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. Um, and so to all of our viewers live and recorded, we invite you to connect with us on social media and visit our website, www.swhr.org. Um, to register for future events, you can download our menopause preparedness toolkit and other women's health resources. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. Um, let's continue this very important conversation with hashtag SWHR Talks Menopause. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>